everyone, in this time lapse video I'm going to show you how I did this portrait of Theo the Rottweiler in pastels. So like all of my portraits, regardless of the medium, once I've done my background and I'm onto the subject, I always start off with the eyes first. They're one of the most important parts of that portrait, obviously it's the soul of that animal, it, they're so expressive, so I really want to make sure that I've got them right from the very beginning, which is why for me personally I like to start off with those first. Now depending on the reference photo, the eyes are going to vary considerably, so what I like to do is I use a tablet for my reference photo and I do zoom into that eye so I'm not focusing on anything else. Once I was fairly happy with the eye here and I'd got it about 80% complete, I then started mapping in the fur around it. Now for Theo's portrait here, I did use pan pastels for my base layer. I mainly used the black and a couple of the greys just to get down a rough base layer, but you'll notice that I'm having to add my darker pencils on top to get that contrast in place. One of the most common things that can happen when you are drawing black fur, especially when you're using pan pastels for your base layer, is we have a real tendency to keep on loading lots more of the black pan pastel for that very first base layer to try and get it as dark as we could possibly be from the very first layer. Now the problem with doing that is you are going to fill the tooth of the paper very early on. That's going to significantly limit how many layers you can then put on top and you're not going to be able to build up the fur like what I am here. Now the filling of the tooth of the paper using pan pastels is something that I cover a lot in my slower Patreon tutorials. Because it's something that can be very frustrating with pastels but it certainly can be avoided. Now the biggest tip that I can give anybody when they are applying the base layer, if it's the pan pastels or soft pastel sticks, ideally you do want to be able to see your sketch lines through that very first layer. If you do still be able to see your sketch lines, it's a good indication then that you do still have remaining tooth left on that paper, so you're going to be able to build up the layers of fur like I am here. And in terms of how I like to layer when I am drawing black fur, I am going to create a dedicated tutorial for YouTube showing that. But what I'm doing here fundamentally is I'm working from dark to light. So I'm going to make sure that I've got my contrast good from the very beginning with my darker base layer and then I'm building up my lighter values gradually. A common mistake that can be very easily done is that you start drawing in the lightest details first because when we look at that reference photo they are the details that are more obvious but they need to be left until the last layer because they overlap everything else. So what we need to do is try and ignore those as best as we can and then try and build up from the fur that's closest to the skin and work up from there. One thing that I demonstrate a lot in a few of the Patreon tutorials is the use of a Gaussian blur. Now the use of a Gaussian blur can really help to hide those top layers of detail. So if you are someone who likes to add all of those details and you do find yourself adding them too early on, a Gaussian blur can really help to prevent that. What it will do is it will blur that image enough so that you can remove the first few layers of obvious detail and that will then enable you to just focus on the main sets of values that we need to be building up for the very few first layers. So when drawing Rottweilers, it's really important that you get the main sets of markings in the right place. So one of the things that makes this breed so iconic is their ginger eyebrows at the top, their ginger muzzles, and then they've also got the patches on the front of their chest as well. So we want to make sure that we've got them in the right place. Not only because that is what one of the things, as I say, that we all know from a Rottweiler, but they are very unique to that animal. So the size of the eyebrow patch is going to vary slightly depending on the specific dog that you're drawing. Now we want to make sure that we get them in the right place because that will really make such a big difference to the overall facial structure. If you position them too high up, you're going to be making it look like obviously the, the eye sockets there are positioned higher than the eyes themselves. It will really adjust the proportions of your artwork. So always cross-reference your eyebrow patches here with the positions of the eyes, where they should be on the face, and it's something that I always check throughout the drawing process. Now of course if you do notice that one is positioned a little higher or they're both not quite right, they can very easily be adjusted, but it's really important just to notice those changes when you see them. And that is also the case with fur direction. Now I spoke a lot about this in my top tips for drawing fur in pastels, which if you haven't seen that and it's of interest, I'll link that in the description below. But the fur direction will ultimately change the bone and muscular structure of that animal. 
So if we don't get that right to the reference photo, our end portrait is not going to resemble as much like that animal as it should do. So for instance, the fur on the top of the head here that I've been working on, you can see how it gradually slopes over towards the left and the right ear. It isn't completely vertical and it isn't horizontal either. So we need to be making sure that we pay really close attention to how we move that pencil and the way that that fur is directed across that face. And the fur direction is going to vary from dog to dog, obviously massively depending on the fur type, whether or not it's a long coated dog or something like a Rottweiler with much shorter fur. But fundamentally we have to make sure that we do get that right to that reference photo. I pay attention more to that rather than worrying about the exact colour. And that's one of the most common questions that I'm asked here on YouTube is, how do you know which colour you should be selecting? Now, for me, I don't worry about the exact colour. I mainly select it based on whether or not I need a warmer colour or a cooler colour on the colour wheel. Take this pencil here, for example. So this is more of the, the grey Carbofello, but you can see this lead looks far more blue. That's because this side of his face was more of those cooler colours, whereas on the other side of his face, it was a little bit more warmer. So I had to make sure that the greys that I selected did have more of those bluer colours to match that. And once I've been building up those highlights gradually, I then go in back with my black Carbofello to make sure that I've got those black sections and those shadows as dark as they need to be. Now the one biggest tip as well that I will say, sometimes you've got a shadow or a darker part of the fur, it doesn't always necessarily mean you need to darken it with a black. Some of these areas here you could use more of the darker navy blues for a shadow, you wouldn't have to always jump to black. And that's something that would be relevant for any fur colour. It would just depend on the colour of the dog that you were drawing. So ones that were more of the orange colours, the burnt siennas, often a purple is a nice colour to complement that to get more of those richer shadows. And if you do have a Rottweiler on the easel, because they are black dogs, there are going to be so many colours that you're going to be able to add in that fur, especially if the light source is strong, if it's taken outside, you're going to have lots more blues potentially in that fur. So it's really important to make sure that where you notice those colours, you do add them in. It adds so much more depth to the fur. And that can also be transferred to your lighter colours as well, not just your shadows. So here I'm using a mixture of my white pastel pencils, but you'll notice that the highlights that I am drawing are not as bright as the actual highlights in the eye. Always check the contrast in your reference photo. What you can do is take a photo of your artwork, make sure it's a fairly accurate photo, turn that black and white and then turn the reference photo black and white and you're going to be able to compare your contrasts. If you think that your contrasts in your drawing are not quite sharp enough so that what that means is you need to make your highlights brighter or your shadows darker, go ahead and make those changes to your artwork. And you don't always have to use white pencils for those highlights. With black fur, there are so many instances where you actually need to use more greys or even some lighter blues and purples. But as I say, that really is going to vary considerably depending on the reference photo that you're working from. So this portrait of Theo here, I was asked to do a few weeks ago. And the chest section of this portrait actually features in a real-time tutorial on Patreon. I had a couple of questions asking how to get a really nice soft blended look when you're doing a head and shoulder portrait. Because his fur here was dark and he's got that black fur on the bottom of his chest, it would be quite, you know, a bit more difficult there to get that nice softed effect given how dark the colour is. So I thought this would be a good one to share that with. So if you would like to see that video, I'll link my Patreon in the description below. And you'll notice that when we get to that part here, even though this is a sped up version, you'll see that it's all about building up that faded look gradually. You don't want to force it too early on. So depending on the Rottweiler that you might be drawing, sometimes around the nose here, this colour is going to be very vibrant with those oranges and burnt siennas. So you want to make sure that you've got those colours in place and you, as best as you can, avoid any muddying up of your layers. Now what I mean by that is sometimes because pastels, if you're not using fixtures in between your layers, it's very easy to pick up pigment from those previous base layers. Now I personally use that to my advantage in my pastel work because it's my way of then creating individual unique colours. There is never one specific colour in your set that is just perfect. Often we have to mix these layers in order to get the final outcome that we're after. 
But when I've got something that is particularly vibrant or the colour is strong, I always like to put those colours in first so that I know I've got my really good colour saturation in place from the beginning. Now I speak about this a lot in my video that I uploaded a couple of weeks ago on how to draw iridescent feathers. So if that's of interest and how to avoid muddying up the layers, I'll link that in the description below. Something that's been made really obvious in this video here is how I like to work in small areas. I don't do one whole layer and then do another layer and work in that method. That's just my personal preference, but I do find by breaking it down like this into small areas, I'm able to be a lot more efficient and effective with how I work. If you're finding a portrait that you're working on is a bit overwhelming, break that down into small sections. Just focus on one or two square inches at a time and then move on to the next once you've got that area about 80% complete. Now the reason why I always say about 80% complete is because usually an area is never really finished until you look at a portrait as a whole. You then will start to notice other things that need to be tweaked. Also, one big tip, if you are struggling with any specific element, so if that's the nose part or the mouth, anything at all, turn your artwork upside down and then turn the reference photo upside down and then your brain will be forced to see that for abstract shapes rather than I know what a nose looks like therefore it should be like this because our brain has a tendency of sort of overriding what we're actually looking at in that reference photo. By turning it upside down your brain processes that image in a different way. Once you've then worked on that area and you're very happy with it, turn everything back up the right way and then you'll notice that it's far more accurate and you've been able to push through that one challenging section but something that can also happen is we just spend far too long at the easel on that one part of the portrait. When you feel like you're getting frustrated put that artwork aside for a couple of days, work on something else and just take a breather from it. Most of the time then that's all that's needed and then you're looking at that artwork with fresh eyes and you're able to tackle that one part that you was previously finding difficult. So as I've said, I go in depth with the Patreon version where I show you how to fade out the chest of a head and shoulder portrait like this. But the one thing that's really important here and you'll notice I've got no harsh edges on that outer surface. I'm adding my details here with my pencils, but the very first base layer is really soft. And that's the very first step that I use to create this faded appearance on a head and shoulder portrait. Now one thing that's going to vary here is this portrait was done on the dark grey pastel matte paper so I don't actually have a background colour in place. If you are trying to do a head and shoulder portrait and you have added a pan pastel background or your soft pastel sticks you're going to already then have pastel pigment that you can blend in with that chest first so that's going to be a little bit more forgiving. But when you're just working straight off on a normal sheet of paper trying to get this faded look can be a little bit more challenging. And I'm going to continue to build up this soft effect on the outer edge here working from left to right. And that brings me on to one of the other questions that I'm asked a lot is how to prevent smudging when you're working with pastels. This is something that can happen very easily but it, again like with the other things here it can be avoided. It does take a little bit of, uh, sort of getting used to the habit of always having something under your hand. You'll see here that with every single tutorial that I upload, I've always got that semi-translucent sheet of paper there called glassine, and I always have that taped to my drawing board. I'm always moving that as well so that I always know that wherever my hand is positioned, I've always got that underneath. I'm also right-handed, so I like to work from left to right. That's also beneficial because I do like working in small sections. I wouldn't want to then start on the right side of the face and work left. It's just much more natural for me to do the other way around. Now if you're left-handed you're going to follow the exact same process but just obviously then potentially start from the right side and work your way across to the left. But the more that you draw and use pastels you'll find that it's something that you will just start to become more aware of the more that you do work with this medium. But I'll have a photo of this finished portrait again at the end of the tutorial here and you'll see that there is no smudging on that background paper. That dark grey pastel matte paper there looks really clean. I've deliberately darkened up my edges and added a lighter glow effect background. For me personally it's just something that I add to all of my pet portraits and I always have done. Now because I did have quite a lot of requests uh, for members on Patreon asking how I create that background, I do have two videos on Patreon showing you how I do my glow effects. 
So I've got a soft pastel stick method. If you're doing a complete solid background colour and you don't want to use the dark grey for instance here, you wanted to completely change that colour but you still wanted to do the glow effect. So that tutorial is available on Patreon and I've also got the glow effect similar to what I would have done here for Theo where I'm actually using the pastel matte paper colour and then just darkening up my edges with a darker grey and then creating a lighter inner glow effect with more of my lighter greys and my white. So both of those options are available on Patreon as well. So in terms of where you decide to fade out the head and shoulder portrait, that's going to be ultimately yours and the client's decision. I like to make sure that I've got a nice balance between how much of the head and chest is visible. I wouldn't want there, for instance here, for the chest to stop at where the orange ginger markings are. That for me would be far too short. It wouldn't therefore have a nice composition. So I like to make sure that I've got a fair amount of the chest visible, even when I am doing a head and shoulder portrait here, just to make sure that it is nice and balanced. I also like to make sure that I've got about an inch from the edge of the ears and the edge of the paper, so that when I mount this, that the subject then isn't going to be wedged right up close to that mount or even potentially covered over. It doesn't look right. I like to make sure that there is a, a nice, as I say, inch, inch and a half space there. And you'll notice that I haven't added the details to the chin yet. That's because I was doing this for that tutorial for Patreon and I had to make sure that I had the chest in first because the muzzle and the chin hairs overlap the ginger section of the chest. So I had to make sure that whatever was behind those details was drawn in first and that they were finished and then I could overlap the details here as I'm starting to do now. And that's something that I always think about with any pet portrait, any wildlife work, any artwork at all really. Whatever element you see where the fur overlaps another section, you have to make sure that you get that previous layer in first on the area next to it. Because otherwise you're going to have to start drawing around your details and that just takes far you know, far longer and just extends that process, makes it far more complicated than it needs to be. So I really hope this video was of use with the tips and techniques that I've shared here. If it was, I'd really appreciate it if you could give the video a thumbs up because it really does help. And if you'd like to get notified of future content, hit the subscribe and the bell button. And if my slower in-depth tutorials are of use, I'll link my Patreon in the description below. I'll be uploading another video to YouTube next week, but if you've got any questions in the meantime, pop them in the comments below. I'm more than happy to answer them if I can.